Hello students, I'm Sunanda Mani. Today I'm going to discuss the chapter Lost Spring. Now Lost Spring refers to the time, to the prime time in one's life which has been lost and it refers to the prime time of the lives of children living in slums or in poverty. This lesson has been written by Anis Jung who was born in Raurkela and spent her childhood and adolescence in Hyderabad. She received her education in Hyderabad and in United States of America. Her parents were both writers. Anis Jung began her career as a writer in India. She has been an editor and columnist for major newspapers in India and abroad and has authored several books. The following chapter is an excerpt from her book titled Lost Spring, Stories of Stolen Childhood. Now here she analyzes the grinding poverty and traditions which condemn these children to a life of exploitation. Now Lost Spring, the excerpt which is included in this chapter is about the lives of two boys, one Sahib Alam and the other one Mukesh. Both these stories are about the children who are condemned to the lives of poverty and exploitation by the rich people. The theme of these stories is this life full of sorrows and miseries of these children who live in abject poverty. They are denied the basic rights of a dignified life. And also, it deals with the apathy of the government. These children have become victims of the vicious circle of the politicians, the capitalists, and the middlemen. Now, how the poem, the chapter, appeals to the society to come forward and provide them the opportunities. Let's go through the chapter. Now, Lost Spring, the excerpt that has been included in this chapter, it deals with the stories of two boys, Sahib Alam and Mukesh. Both of these boys are living a life of abject poverty. And the chapter highlights the apathy of the government, the apathy of the society. In fact, it is an appeal to the society to come forward and help these children live a dignified life. These children have been victims of the nexus between the capitalists, the politicians, the pol policemen and the middlemen. So the author, by showing us these stories, wants to appeal to the government as well as to the people to come forward and provide them opportunities for a better life. Now the first story is about Sahib Alam. Sometimes I find a rupee in the garbage. In this story, the author comes across a rag picker whom she asks, why do you do this? And the boy tells her that he is doing it. He has been doing it. He has been scrunching the garbage. Garbage means the dump grounds where people throw their rubbish. He has been a rag picker there since long. And he says, whom I encounter every morning scrounging for gold in the garbage dumps of my neighborhood. Now do you think actually he got gold out of it? No. Gold here means anything valuable. It could be eatables, it could be money or anything which they could sell and earn money. So Sahib leaves his house in the morning and goes to pick up whatever is valuable from those dumping grounds. He left his home in Dhaka. Now he belongs to a family of refugees who have migrated from Dhaka to India. His home is not even a distant memory. That means he still remembers 
There were many storms that swept away their fields and homes, his mother tells him. That's why they left looking for gold in the big city where now he lives. So probably they had everything in Dhaka. They had their green fields, but there was probably no crop grown in those fields because of the barren lands. So they had to come out of Dhaka for a livelihood and they migrated to India. <clears throat> she asked him, why do you go there? Why do you look out for garbage? Why do you go to these garbage heaps? And he says, I have nothing else to do. He mutters. She suggests, why don't you go to a school? But he says, I do not have any school in the neighborhood. When they build one, I will go. So he does not have any opportunity of going to a school. That is one way of saying. And perhaps the reality is that he cannot afford the fee of a school. She says, if I start a school, will you come? Half joking. That means she just said for the heck of it. And soon she realized that she had made a wrong statement. He was very much willing to come there and he says, yes. And after a few days when he meets her, he says, is your school ready? And she realizes her folly. She realizes that she has made him a promise which was absolutely meaningless and hollow. And perhaps many such promises had been made to this boy before also. So it takes longer to build a school, I say. Embarrassed at having made a promise that was not meant. She soon realizes that the promise could not be fulfilled because it was not easy to make a school where this boy could go. But promises like mine abound in every corner of his bleak world. What does it mean? It means that his life is full of such hollow promises. Bleak world means hopeless world, which does not hold any promise to be fulfilled. After months of knowing him, I ask him his name, Sahib Alam. Now his name is very ironical, Sahib Alam. It meant the Lord of the universe. And she feels that the boy probably does not understand the meaning of his world. His world is full of garbage, scrounging in the garbage, looking out for valuables in the dumping yards. And his name means that he is the king, he is the lord of the world. Whereas his life is totally opposite to what his name means. This is ironical. Unaware of what his name represents, he roams the streets with his friends. An army of barefoot boys. An army of barefoot boys. That means a whole group of boys who have not worn anything on their feet. They do not have any footwear. Who appear like the morning birds and disappear at noon. It means who appear like morning birds. It's a simile here. It means they come in the morning like birds, a group of birds who, uh, who start chirping in the morning and they go off to sleep in the afternoon because of the heat of the sun. So these boys also come in the morning, come in groups, go to the dumping grounds, scrounge for something valuable every day. That's a routine with them. Now the next question she asks him is, why aren't you wearing chappals? My mother did not bring them down from the shelf, he answers simply. Even if she did, he will throw them off, adds another, who is wearing shoes that do not match. Now, imagine these children. They are so poor that they cannot afford to buy footwear for themselves. One of the boys in that group is wearing shoes which do not match with each other. They have been discarded by someone rich and he has picked them up from that garbage heap and he's wearing, but the other one is not even wearing shoes on his feet, not even the ones which do not match. And an excuse that, uh, that he gives for not wearing shoes is that his mother did not bring them from up, up shelf and he was not wearing anything. 
but the reality is that he is not able to buy anything, any footwear for himself and he has not found any footwear from the garbage so far. So that is the reason. Just to hide that embarrassment, he has made a false excuse that his mother has not brought them for him. Now she gives a reference to a story about a man from Udipi. Once, as a young boy, he would go to school past an old temple where his father was a priest. So this story is about a boy who was a son of a priest. Every day he used to go to the temple and pray that goddess may give him a pair of shoes. He would every day pray for that. Now 30 years later I visited his town and the temple which was now drowned in an air of desolation. Desolation, loneliness. So when after 30 years Anise Jung visited that temple, she noticed that the son of the priest was dressed in a grey uniform, wearing socks and shoes. He arrived panting, panting breathlessness and threw his school bag on a folding bed. Now, why she has given a reference to this story is that the son of a priest had prayed for shoes and after 30 years, she could notice that a child of a priest was wearing shoes. He was going to the school. He was living a normal life, a life like any other normal child would lead. There was a change in the standard of living. Though it was not huge, but still they could now afford the basic amenities of life. But this child, Mukesh, probably the standard of living had not changed for them over the years. They had been rag pickers earlier. Their children had to follow the same profession over the years and there was not change in their lifestyle at all. Now I remembered the prayer another boy had made to the goddess when he had finally got a pair of shoes. Let me never lose them. Again, it meant that the children of priests, they prayed for shoes, they got them. And they prayed that they never lose the shoes, probably the prayer was granted, the wish was granted and now they could afford to buy shoes for themselves. So my acquaintance with the barefoot rag pickers lead me to Seemapuri, a place on the periphery of Delhi, yet miles away from it metaphorically. Now this expression means that the Bangladeshi refugees had migrated from their own country and settled on the borders of Delhi at a place called Seemapuri. Seemapuri is a slum in Delhi. It's on the outskirts of Delhi. She says, it is on the periphery of Delhi, the yet miles away from it. It means, though it is very near Delhi, in physical terms, but the standard of living is miles apart. The standard of living of the people living in Delhi and of the people living in Simapuri is miles apart from each other. Now those who live here are squatters who came from Bangladesh back in 1971 and Sahib's family is one of them. Simapuri at that time was an empty place but now it is filled with the refugees of Bangladesh. They have their small huts covered with the tarpaulins or thatched roofs or things which are of temporary nature but they are devoid of the basic amenities of sewage, drainage or running water. There are about 10,000 rag pickers staying in that area. They do not have an identity of their own. They are staying there without permits but they have their ration cards. How come that is possible? It's possible because the politicians have got them the ration cards which they need to vote for them. So they are the vote banks. They have got the identity cards and they have been allowed to stay there without the permits. They have got the ration cards because it guarantees the politicians that they will get their votes. For these dwellers of Simapuri, 
food is more important for survival than an identity. They are not bothered about the identity cards. They are not bothered about anything but food. All they want is food for both the times. If at the end of the day we can feed our families and go to bed without an aching stomach, we would rather live here than in the fields that gave us no grain. It means that back in their own country, Bangladesh, they had their fields, but they were barren lands. They could not get them any crops. They could not have any grains to eat by living in those huge fields and huge houses. But here in India, they might be living in the small hutments, yet they can afford to buy food for both times and sleep well at night without empty aching stomachs. Now, they have been living there, they have pitched their tents and they are happy with that kind of arrangement because they get food. Children grow up in these tents, becoming partners in survival. This is an important expression. It means their children also grow up and learn the art of rag picking. They become partners in survival means they also contribute to the family income, which is by selling the valuables they have picked up from the heaps of garbage. Through the years, it has acquired the proportions of a fine art. It has become a skill with the children of rag pickers to find out the valuable things. Garbage to them is gold. Garbage to them is gold means it is something valuable that they always try to find from those heaps of garbage. It is their daily bread, a roof of their, over their heads, even if it is a leaking roof. Even if the roof is leaking, they don't mind. At least they have a roof over their heads. But for a child, it is even more. So for a child, it is more than just a profession. I sometimes find a rupee, even a 10 rupee note, Sahib says, his eyes lighting up. Now he says that at times he finds some coins, some one rupee no, uh, coins or 10 rupee note in the garbage. And for them, it is actually a better way of getting valuables than their parents because it is wrapped in wonders. For children, it is wrapped in wonder. For the elders, it is a means of survival. Now, elders think that yes, they'll go and find out some probably uh, paper or something which they can sell. But children, they feel that it is all full of wonder. This garbage is full of wonder. Wonder means surprises because at times they find money lying over there. And at times they find such good things which can fetch them money. And one winter morning, next, when she goes, she sees Sahib standing by the fenced gate of the neighborhood club, watching two young men dressed in white playing tennis. I like the game, he hums, content to watch it standing behind the fence. Now, one day, she notices Sahib standing by the fence of a tennis court. And he says, I only go there when no one is around the chokidar or the gatekeeper, he lets me use the swing. So that is one pleasure he derives. He, he likes the game. He wants to play the game, but he knows that he cannot. He cannot have access to that luxury of life because he cannot afford to buy those tennis shoes or that white dress which one is required to wear while playing tennis. So he is satisfied by going inside the tennis court and using the swing. Sahib is also wearing tennis shoes that look strange over his dirty clothes, but he says he's very candid, he's very honest in admitting that someone gave them to me, he says in the manner of an explanation. And the fact that they are discarded shoes of some rich boy who perhaps refused to wear them because of a hole in one of them. So he's happy to wear the shoes which have been discarded by the 
rich boy. Now next morning, Anis Jang notices that Sahib is on his way to a tea stall. He has given up that rag picking and has taken up a job at a tea stall. So he is going to his tea stall to a milk booth to buy some milk for the tea stall and he tells her that now I work there. He gets about 800 rupees a month and all my meals. I am paid 800 rupees and all my meals. So, but the question is, does he like the job? He says he has lost the carefree look. The steel canister seems heavier than the plastic bag he would carry so lightly over his shoulder. Why does it seem so? Because now he is no longer the master of his own will. He has lost that carefree look on his face. He is working for someone. He is subjected to the will of his master. He is no longer a free boy. He is carrying that steel canister which is probably lighter than the bag that he used to carry on his shoulders. But it seemed heavier to him because he has lost his freedom. He is no longer a master of his own will. The canister belongs to the man who owns the tea shop. Sahib is no longer his own master. So this is the story of the boy Sahib who was a rag picker and ultimately took up a job of 800 rupees a month and all his meals because he was deprived of the basic amenities, basic food which he most required even after working the whole day while picking up rags from the heaps of garbage. So he had to take up that job though it was supposed to be a lighter job than what he used to do the whole day earlier. Still he felt that his freedom had been lost and he was no longer a master of his own will. Now next story is about a boy Mukesh. The name of the story is I want to drive a car. This boy lives in Ferozabad and he dreams to become a motor mechanic. She asks him, do you know anything about cars? He says, I will learn to drive a car. His dream looms like a mirage amidst the dust of streets that fill his town, Ferozabad, famous for its bangles. He lives in Ferozabad, which is famous for bangle making. And his dream looms like a mirage. Mirage, illusion. Brahm jisko hum bolte. It's amidst the dust of streets that fill his town, Ferozabad. It seems to be a hazy dream. It seems to be very unclear, unachievable, because he belongs to a family of Bengal makers and he lives in a small town of Ferozabad. She goes further to explain why this dream of his has been likened to a mirage. She says, it, every family in that town is engaged in Bengal making. It's known for this industry. Ferozabad is known for this industry. And Mukesh's family is among them. All these families, they have been engaged in Bengal making since time immemorial. Generation after generation, they have been working on this profession. She says they are, it is not legal to have children like him to work in the glass furnaces with high temperatures in dingy cells without air and light. So very inhuman conditions where he is working and it is not legal either because the child laws of child labor prevent such small children from working in the factories. They slog their daylight hours often losing the brightness of their eyes. So they have been working so long that they almost tend to lose their eyesight. Mukesh's eyes beam as he volunteers to take me home. Beam means glowed up, shined. He wanted Anis Jung to come to his home. 
So down the stinking lanes which have been choked with garbage, they walk down to his house, but he's still very proud to take her along because his house had been renovated recently. So they reach her house, he bangs a wobbly iron door, wobbly, shaky, bangs an iron door with his foot and pushes it open. They enter a half-built shack. They enter a house. Lady with her veiled face. A frail young woman is cooking the evening meal for the whole family. A frail means weak. She is sitting there. She is the bhabi of Mukesh. She has covered her face with a cloth because the father-in-law is also there. She is responsible for cooking meals for all the men folk of the family. She is in charge of the three men, her husband, Mukesh, and their father. And when the older man enters, she gently withdraws behind the broken wall and brings her veil closer to her face. Veil is the cloth that covers her face. She says, as custom demands, daughter-in-law must veil their faces before male elders. Now, despite long years of hard labor, first as a tailor, then a bangle maker, he has failed to renovate a house send his two sons to school. All he has managed to do is teach them what he knows, the art of making bangles. This is about Mukesh's father. He has tried all the things. He had been tailor earlier and then he learned bangle making and since ages he had been doing that. And still he could not manage to afford to renovate his house properly and send his sons to school. All he has been able to do is that he has taught them the art of making bangles. It is his karam, his destiny, says Mukesh's grandmother. Now the family, the old ladies and the family has accepted that it is their destiny to be in the trade of bangle making. This is a family lineage which cannot be broken. They have accepted it and they are into it. They cannot dare to differ from anybody. She says, can a God-given lineage be, ever be broken? So she implies that they have been born in the caste of Bengal makers. They cannot dare to defy the will of God. This is something which God has made them for and they will be doing it whatever the circumstances are. So Ferozabad is full of bangles of all colors, sunny gold, petty green, royal blue, pink, purple, every color born out of the seven colors of the rainbow. And they are kept there in the spirals and in the mounds, in unkempt yards. Unkempt means not very clean, a little bit haphazard, not very organized are piled on the four-wheeled hand carts pushed by young men along the narrow lanes of shanty town. And they have been doing it for many years and the girls and the boys with their fathers and mothers, they have been wielding the glasses into circles of bangles. Now, their eyes are more adjusted to the dark than to the light outside. It means that they are so used to working in those dingy small factories with high temperatures that they probably would not be able to adjust to the natural bright light of sun. There's a girl which, who lives near their house. Her name is Savita. She is dressed up in a pink dress and she sits along with an elderly woman soldering pieces of glass. She is also making bangles. The whole of the families are engaged in bangle making. She is making bangles. Very mechanically her hands are working, but she does not realize the sanctity of the bangles. She might be wearing them. What is the sanctity? What do these bangles signify? they signify the auspiciousness, the prosperity of a happy married life. Anisjan goes further to suggest that these girls or these women, 
they are making bangles without realizing the significance of these bangles. They are wearing them, they are making bangles, they cannot afford meals for themselves and still they are wearing them. Why? Because they do not know that these bangles signify happiness in married life which probably they are not. They are not at all happy and she says Ek vakt ser bhar khana bhi nahi khaya. She says in a voice drained of joy. That means there is no joy in her voice. Certainly there would be no joy because she has not eaten a full meal in her entire lifetime. And this is what she has got after working so hard. Her husband, an old man with a flowing beard says, I know nothing except bangles. That means he doesn't know anything except making bangles. And all I have done is make a house for the family to live in. After putting in so much of hard work throughout these years, all he has managed to do is make a house for the family to live in. The cry of not having money to do anything except carry on the business of making bangles, not even enough to eat, rings in every house. So this is a problem which is common in all the houses of Firozabad that they do not have enough money to do anything else and they do not know anything other than making bangles. Little has moved with time it seems in Firozabad. Years of mind-numbing toil have killed all the initiative and ability to dream. So toil means hard work. So years of hard work has killed the initiative in those people to do anything different. They cannot dare to do anything different. And there are so many other factors also. She asked them, why not organize yourself into a cooperative? She meant, why don't you people have labor unions who could probably guide you to something different? There are many opportunities in this world. And she wants them to avail themselves of those opportunities. But she gets the reply that they have fallen into the vicious circle of middlemen who trapped their fathers and forefathers. Now, there is a vicious circle of the middlemen, the capitalists, the money lenders, the policemen going on in that town. They have been trapped into debts and these middlemen would not let them go out of that trap. If at all they dare to do, they are picked up by the policemen and beaten. So they are forced to come back to their trade and pay the debts back to the capitalists with high interest. They cannot dare to go out because they do not have any alternatives. They do not have any money. They do not know anything. So that is the reason they are stuck into this trade generation after generation. Their fathers are as tired as they are. They talk endlessly in a spiral that moves from the poverty to apathy to greed and to injustice. This is what their life is full of. Greed, apathy of the government, injustice. So she said, listening to them, I see two distinct worlds. One of the family caught in a web of poverty, burdened by the stigma of caste in which they are born, and the other, a vicious circle of the sahukars, the middlemen, the policemen, the keepers of law, the bureaucrats, and the politicians. So together, the influential people of society, the moneyed people of society, have created a nexus in which they do not allow these skilled workers to move out of that nexus and they do not allow them to dare to dream of doing something different. Now, when I sense a flash of it in Mukesh, flash of it means a flash of daring to be different. I am cheered. I want to be a motor mechanic, he repeats. He will go to a garage and learn. But the garage is a long way from his home. It means that it is not easy for him to become a motor mechanic because he lacks the resources. I will walk, he insists. I will walk, he insists. Again, has a metaphorical meaning. It means that he will still 
try. Though it is difficult, he will still try to do it. Do you also dream of flying a plane? He's suddenly silent. No, he says, staring at the ground. In his small murmur, there is an embarrassment that has not turned into regret. He is content to dream of cars that he sees hurtling down the streets of his town. Few airplanes fly over Firozabad. That means he has tried to dream of something different. But still, that is still within his reach and he seems to make it possible with his determination. It seems he could make it, but dreaming of flying an aeroplane is something next to impossible. And he feels embarrassed to have dared to do something different. Still, he is quite determined. And he says, few airplanes fly over Firozabad. And in my next video, I will come back and discuss the question answers with you.